The following video describes the ultrasound-assisted paraspinous approach to lumbar central neuraxial blockade. It is a useful alternative to the conventional ultrasound-assisted central neuraxial block, which utilizes a midline approach and is described in a companion video to this one. The ultrasound-assisted midline approach requires adequate images of the vertebral canal, which can sometimes be difficult to obtain in patients with challenging anatomy, such as morbid obesity or narrowed interspinous and interlaminar spaces. The paraspinous approach is a useful alternative in these circumstances as it does not require visualization of the vertebral canal. The paraspinous or paramedian needle approach is also more effective in patients who have narrowed interspaces. A clear understanding of the anatomy of the lumbar vertebrae is important for performance of neuraxial blockade as well as the interpretation of ultrasound images. The vertebral canal can only be accessed through the interlaminar space. The interlaminar space is bounded by the spinous processes above and below, the lamina and the articular processes on either side. Contact with the articular processes and facet joint often produces ipsilateral non-radiating back pain and indicates that you are off the midline. A low frequency curved array ultrasound probe is recommended for scanning the adult lumbar spine, particularly in obese patients. The structures of interest are located deep to the skin and low frequencies are necessary for adequate penetration. The wide field of view of a curved array facilitates recognition of the anatomy. The frequency of the probe should be set to the low range and the focus and depth also set appropriately. An initial depth setting of at least 8 cm is usually required. The patient may be placed in either a sitting or lateral decubitus position. The ultrasound machine is positioned on the opposite side of the bed in the operator's line of sight. The goal is to achieve good ergonomics for scanning. The probe should be held in a firm but comfortable grip that allows application of pressure, but also controlled sliding and tilting movements. Novices may find a two-handed grip easier, but with practice, a one-handed grip may be sufficient. Ensure that the probe hand is braced against the skin of the patient's back to prevent inadvertent slipping of the probe. There are three common probe orientations used in ultrasound scanning of the spine. These are the paramedian sagittal view in which the probe is placed in a longitudinal orientation perpendicular to the patient's back. Next, the paramedian sagittal oblique view in which the probe is angled towards the midline to penetrate the lateral interlaminar space. And finally, the transverse midline view in which the probe is placed in a transverse orientation across the midline of the neuraxis. The paramedian sagittal oblique view serves primarily to identify the intervertebral levels by counting up from the L5-S1 junction. In the simplified approach to ultrasound-assisted neuraxial blockade described here, the L3-4 intervertebral level is estimated using the intercrystal line, and only the transverse midline view is necessary. The ultrasound-assisted paraspinous approach to lumbar neuraxial block is performed as follows. The patient is appropriately positioned and the top of the iliac crests are palpated and marked to indicate the approximate position of the L3-4 intervertebral space. The probe is placed on the patient's back in a transverse orientation over the midline and slid in a kephalad or cordat direction. A two-handed grip with fingers braced on the patient's back offers the most control and stability of the probe. <laughs> 
There are two possible views that may be obtained. The first is the spinous process view, in which the probe and beam are directly over a spinous process. The second is the interspinous view, in which the beam is directed between adjacent spinous processes. The interspinous view is essential for the ultrasound-assisted midline approach, as it identifies the soft tissue window through the interspinous and interlaminar space. In patients with good sonoanatomy, this is recognizable by the hyperechoic lines of the posterior complex and anterior complex. The posterior complex represents the ligamentum flavum and posterior dura and is usually at the level of the base of the articular process. The anterior complex represents the anterior dura posterior longitudinal ligament and vertebral body. This is usually at the level of or slightly below the transverse process. In patients with challenging anatomy, such as morbid obesity or narrowed interspinous spaces, it is however not always possible to obtain an adequate interspinous view. In contrast, the spinous process and the adjacent laminae are easily recognizable by the dense acoustic shadow that they cast on ultrasound. This is true even in very obese individuals in whom the spinous process is identifiable on ultrasound as a vertical acoustic shadow with a hyperechoic apex at its most superficial aspect. This transverse spinous process view is the only view that is necessary for the ultrasound-assisted paraspinous approach. Once a spinous process view has been obtained, its acoustic shadow is centered on the midline of the screen. In most machines, pressing the M mode button calls up a center line that can be used to help with this centering process. The accuracy of this and the subsequent skin marking are essential to the success of the paraspinous approach. The probe is held steady and any gel should be cleaned off thoroughly before attempting skin marking. The midpoint of the long edge of the probe is marked to indicate the location of the neuraxial midline. The midpoint of the short edge of the probe is marked to indicate the location of the spinous process. The scanning and marking process is repeated for at least two adjacent spinous processes. Any remaining gel is wiped off and the marks are then extended to intersect as shown. The intersection of these two marks indicates the location of the tip of the spinous process. The appropriate needle insertion point is marked approximately 1 cm lateral to the neuraxial midline and 1 cm superior to the line of the lower spinous process. The average adult lumbar spinous process is about 1 cm wide in its lateral dimension and the needle is thus inserted immediately alongside the spinous process, hence the term paraspinous. Medial angulation should be no more than 5 to 10 degrees. The interlaminar space lies between the two spinous processes and is reached by angling the needle kephalad no more than 5 to 10 degrees to begin with. If the skin markings were made on dry, clean skin, they can be preserved by careful skin preparation. If desired, the needle insertion point can also be further marked by indenting the skin with the hub or cap of a needle. Local anesthetic is infiltrated at the marked insertion point. Unlike a midline approach, the needle will be passing through paraspinous muscle, which can be painful, and thus generous infiltration to the full length of the needle should be performed 
the block needle is inserted at the marked insertion point. It should be angled slightly towards the midline about 5 to 10 degrees to advance along the side of the spinous process. It should be angled slightly cephaled also about 5 to 10 degrees to aim for the interlaminar space located superior to the spinous process. If the needle is angled too much towards the midline, the side of the spinous process will be contacted, and this is signified by bony contact at a relatively shallow depth. If not sufficiently angled, the needle will strike the facet joint, and the patient may complain of ipsilateral back pain. If either of these occur, the needle should be redirected accordingly. There should also only be slight cephalet angulation of approximately 5 to 10 degrees to the horizontal to begin with. If there is bony contact, it usually signifies contact with the lamina, and the first maneuver should be to redirect the needle very slightly cephalet. This should be done in very gradual increments as necessary until the needle is walked off the lamina into the interlaminar space. This is usually apparent as a change in needle feel as it penetrates the ligamentum flavum. Entry into the intrathecal or epidural space is signaled by the usual endpoints of CSF backflow or loss of resistance respectively. Note that in obese patients, a longer needle may sometimes be required and the need for this can be determined by measuring the depth to the tip of the spinous process. The anterior-posterior length of the adult lumbar spinous process is approximately 3.5 cm, and thus, the minimum depth to the lamina and the ligamentum flavum can be estimated by adding these two distances. If a longer spinal needle is used in obese patients, a 22-gauge needle is preferable to a 25-gauge needle as it is stiffer and less likely to deviate from its intended trajectory. The spinous process should be identified and marked where its hyperechoic apex is most evident. Accurate centering of the neuraxial midline on the screen and marking on the skin is essential to success of this technique. Bony contact on the first needle pass is common and needle redirection is often required. Having a clear understanding of bony anatomy and what the bony contact signifies is key to successful redirection. Finally, consider using a longer needle if the estimated depth to the ligamentum flavum is more than 8 cm. Further experience with ultrasound scanning and recognition of sonoanatomy can be obtained by using the online lumbar spine ultrasound module available at the following website. The website can also be found by searching for PIE Toronto Spine.